Welcome to the Pop Culture Explorers Club. I'm founding explorer Drew Gergich. And I am the other founding explorer. My name is Mike Celestino. We have a fun episode. One of the things that Mike and I talked about when he started this podcast was we wanted to find experts who knew whatever it was that we were talking about this week. And Mike, you found somebody perfect for this show. Yeah, with the new movie Dune Part 2 coming out, I wanted to talk about Dune. It's not a franchise that I know terribly well, like Star Wars, where I'm immersed in every aspect of it. I have a very casual, very novice relationship with Dune. So I knew my friend John William Ross is a big, big Dune fan. He's read most of the novels. He's super into the original film. And I just thought he would be a great guy to talk about Dune with us. Yeah, you undersold. Uh, I, I can't wait for folks to hear about it. And why don't we let them hear about it right now? And our guest lecturer for this week at the Pop Culture Explorers Club is my good friend of 25 plus years, which is completely insane to me to say that. Uh, he's a filmmaker and he's been making movies for as long as I've known him. But recently he had one that you can actually go and watch on Hulu right now called Grim Cuddy. His name is John William Ross, or as we call him, John Ross. John, thank you so much for joining us. How are you? I'm great. Thanks for having me. And also, I don't know if you remember, but 25 years ago, you were a guest on my USC radio show. So it's kind of like coming. That's full right. Circle now. Yeah. John, John, the musical Tauntaun. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> that's fabulous. It was, it was named that at one point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just cut it open and you'll get the good beats. <laughs> So, John, when we when Drew and I started talking about doing an episode about Dune, because there is this new Dune movie coming up, the first person I thought of was you, because I think you're the biggest Dune fan that I know. So let's start off with asking you a little bit about your history with this franchise. Did you grow up reading the novels? What appealed to you about Dune? Uh, no, I didn't really read the novels until later. I mean, I was a big Star Wars fan as a child growing up, as you know. In the 80s, I was interested in just about anything that took place in space and had spaceships, you know. And my parents had told me that Dune was a huge bomb and don't bother. And But I liked the VHS cover, so I rented it anyway. And I remember it being really weird when yeah. I saw it on VHS, <laughs> but it it like stuck in my mind forever. There's something about the movie that you just can't forget. I revisited the movie in my teenage years. I have a fondness for B movies. I think even the biggest bombs have a lot of underappreciated merits. So I watched the movie again, and then I was like, you know what? I never read the book, so I went and read the book. I loved it. It wasn't until college that I read the sequel, the first sequel, Dune Messiah, which I absolutely loved. It's one of my favorite books of all time. And then the the Dune series just turned into something that I would always go and look up whenever I went to a bookstore at airports. So Dune kind of turned into my go-to airport novel series. And I eventually got through all the Frank Herbert ones, the two books that take place after the Frank Herbert series that were written by his son and Kevin J. Anderson. And then I read the Legends of Dune trilogy, which is like a prequel prequel series. I didn't quite finish the prequel trilogy. But I got through like one and a half of those. So I've read quite a bit of them. And I'm obviously excited to finally use this knowledge for something. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm I'm actually about a quarter away through the first novel. I must have read past the the hand in the box scene, I don't know how many times. And then the book just slows down as they're navigating to get over to Arrakis. And I just never could get past it. But I'm going to finish it this year. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. If the, If that part of the book is slow for you, you're going to have a lot of trouble later on. That's what people tell me. But they, yeah. they say once you get past that middle part, that's just like, oh, it, it, it's an amazing book, apparently. So I think it's all about getting past the first book. Honestly, okay. I, the, the first book is great. But in my opinion, the second book is superior. It's kind of like up and down roller coaster after that. But getting through the second book after the second book, I think you're either hooked or you're not. John, you mentioned the connection to Star Wars, and that's that's where I first heard about Dune. Obviously, I'm a Star Wars fan as well, and you would read these lists of things that influenced George Lucas when he was writing. The Dune novel always came up on those lists, and you can see some of the direct parallels, like this idea of mining for spice. C-3PO men mentions the spice mines of Kessel in the right. first Star Wars movie. 
And then, of course, you've got the desert planet. And there's almost kind of like a sandworm skeleton in the background there, which they've retconned into being the crate dragon. But I do feel like there's a lot of Dune nods in there. And then we also have to mention that the director of the original Dune movie, David Lynch, was in talks to direct Return of the Jedi, which, you know, would have been a very, very different film if that had gone through. It would have been a lot more gross. (laughs) Yes. Do you know the path that David Lynch took from that discussion and, you know, not helming Return of the Jedi, but going on to direct Dune? How did he go from one to the other? I honestly don't know as much about that, but I know they were going to a lot of prestige directors at the time asking them if they wanted to do Dune. I know that Ridley Scott was in the running to do it at one point. You know, they wanted Dune to be Star Wars for adults. That's what they kept saying, which I think is maybe already right there. That's maybe a little bit misguided because I think the whole appeal of Star Wars is that you get to revert to childhood for two hours and nobody in the 80s went to the movies to be an adult. Like, that's not what 80s cinema was about. I can see the wisdom of hiring David Lynch to do it. I mean, he had just done The Elephant Man I think the Elephant Man kind of cemented his reputation as like a prestige director. It had done really well at festivals and won a lot of awards. But he had also done Eraserhead, which was an art film for the masses. But I think people knew from that that he was like a great visual stylist. And I think they wanted to elevate Dune from Star Wars a little bit. They wanted it to feel more elevated, more prestigious. So it seems like the rational, logical choice for it. But going back to what you're saying about the the parallels between Dune and Star Wars, there's there's so many that it's hard to even count them all. But you can definitely see how Dune had to have influenced George Lucas. The whole thing about needing proper calculations to go into hyperspace so that you don't run into an asteroid or something, that's what the guild navigators in Dune universe do. I think the idea of Anakin Skywalker, I mean, skipping ahead to the later trilogy, being this like messiah... That's very much influenced by Dune. There's a lot of parallels between Luke and Paul as characters and how they're kind of like conflicted between their like personal relationships with friends and family, but also these movements, like political movements that they're attached to as well and that they have a responsibility to. And also the Jedi are very similar to the Bene Gesserit. Oh my Uh, goodness. That's the one that's so, so on the nose. They're both kind of like Zen Buddhism on crack sort of communicating with your dead ancestors, you know, and like having control of your body processes and influencing people with your voice, the black robes. To me, that's where the most similarities are. Another thing that jumped out at me in the original, in the 84 movie, that's not in the newer movie, but John, you can answer this question if this is in the novels, but the voice activated weapons, is that right out of the novels? The weirding modules from the David Lynch's student? No, those those were not in the books. That was okay. added by added by David Lynch. I kind of re- wonder if that was a little bit of studio influence. Like we gotta have a gun. It's a space movie, so we have to have laser guns going pew yeah. pew pew okay. pew pew. Yeah. Because what? like in the book, spoiler alert, at the finale of the book, the Fremen attack the Sardaukar riding on worms, and the worms like crush a lot of the Sardaukar, but then the in the David Lynch Dune, they're on top of the worms, like shooting the Sardaukar with lasers. <laughs> but in the book, they they like leap off of the worms and fight the uh, Sardaukar with with their Chris knives. OK, it's all hand to hand. Yeah. The, the first thing that jumped to my mind when I saw them practicing with those weapons was all those stories you always hear about on the set of the Star Wars movies where people are fighting with blasters or lightsabers and they can't help themselves but make the noises, you know, like, yep. um, or like, <laughs> pew, pew, pew. But then right, it, yeah. they like worked that into Dune. Like you can do that in Dune. You get to make the noises yourself. Well, I wonder if that was like kind of a subtle uh, satire on David Lynch's part where he's kind of like poking <laughs> fun at Star Wars. Just speak into your weirding module and point the gun at him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Speaking of David Lynch, do you think he was the right choice for the director of the 1984 version? I feel like that brings up the larger question of should you attempt to make this into a movie ever at all? (laughs) But I think he was a risky choice, not a bad one. He had a unique style. I think, like I said, The Elephant Man was highly regarded prestige film and they wanted to elevate this. So it it just makes sense. Are you a Lynch fan in general, John? Yeah, absolutely. I love David Lynch. 
there's so many things in the Dune movie, like recurring motifs in that movie that are reflected in all his other works, which I think is really interesting. The guild members, I don't know if you remember the 1984 version, how the people from the spacing guild talk into these microphones. They kind of look like old timey, like stage microphones from like a radio studio. That's totally a David Lynch thing because microphones like that are like a recurring theme in all his movies. There's always a, huh. people on a stage talking into those like old tiny microphones. That was like a really interesting touch that he brought to because in Dune, thinking machines or computers are banned. Technology is only allowed to reach a certain level of complexity. So that's why all the technology feels a little bit clunky, slightly old fashioned, but like kind of a retro futuristic version of those things. There's a lot of similarities between all the uh, mechanical devices that appear in the Dune movie feel very Lynchian to me. You can see parallels between that and all the like clunky mechanical stuff in mostly Eraserhead, but some of his other movies beyond that, too. Well, I was super impressed. I mean, right away I saw. So Jack Nance uh, was in the movie, the guy who was in Eraserhead, if I'm remembering that right. You see, right. Uh, obviously, Kyle McLaughlin, who we worked with in lots of other films, uh, Blue Velvet, and then uh, obviously the Twin Peaks TV show and the the Twin Peaks revival. I think Everett McGill was in some other movies for David Lynch, uh, the guy who played um, Stilgar. So it, it was super interesting to see that uh, he has a stable of actors that he, he seems to go to on a regular basis. That was pretty interesting. Well, I, I think that Dune is the movie where he met that whole stable of actors, because I'm pr- pretty sure that Dune was the first movie where he had worked with any of those people. You know, the actor from Nance from Racerhead was the one actor that had been in one of his previous projects, but everyone else I think was my understanding is Dune was like the first time he had worked with them. I kind of have a feeling that after Dune was released, David Lynch was like, what am I going to do now? So many of those actors he cast again in blue velvet And Blue Velvet was very much like a course correction for his career, I think, or he wanted it to be one. Blue Velvet is more of a personal film for him, but he brought a lot of these actors that he'd worked with with, from Dune. I don't know if if it was kind of like a, uh, hey guys, like I can put you in a better movie. (laughs) (laughs) It won't be like that. Let's Let's go do this one. Yeah. Has David Lynch talked about how he feels about Dune in retrospect? Yeah. I mean, he's. He's not too happy with it. I think I was watching an interview with him where he's talking about how after Dune, he resolved that he would never again do a movie where he didn't have Final Cut because he didn't have Final Cut with Dune. And that's like one of his biggest regrets with the movie. So, look, I think the the problem with David Lynch's Dune and the problem with just trying to adapt Dune in general is that they I think all the missteps of the 1984 Dune, in my opinion, were made in the development stage because they didn't decide way in advance how long the movie was going to be. And they didn't decide far enough in advance what scenes they were going to leave in and what they were going to take out and how it was going to be structured. In my opinion, that's what doomed the movie. If they'd figured that out more in advance, it would have turned out so much better and would have been way better received. But I think what happened was they set David Lynch loose and he shot all the stuff. I mean, as you know, there's like the three and a half hour long Alan Smithy cut of Dune out there somewhere. There's like all these extra scenes that they left out that they sh- they actually shot. I think what happened was right as the release of the movie was looming and they were seeing the cuts, the studio said hey, like no matter what, this movie needs to be two hours and 17 minutes long because two hours and 17 minutes is as long as your movie can be before you start to have to have less screenings per day per Mm. screen, which means less money. So if if it goes over two hours and 17 minutes, then you're losing like a screening per day for that screen and it's less money. I'm sure that David Lynch, when they said like, hey, this has to be two hours and 17 minutes, I'm sure it was like, well, damn it. Like, why didn't you tell me this before? You know, no, really. Like if they had just made that decision earlier, it would have saved them so much trouble and saved the movie so many problems. And I think that's, you can see that with the, the new Dune movies, they're 
way more conscious of that. You, I, I feel like they had a very clear plan about how long each movie was going to be and how each one was going to be structured and how they were going to strategically condense the novel. And I think the story and the scripts for the new Dune movies work a lot better because they put more thought into that in the development stage. If only this trend of splitting movies into two had existed back in the early 80s, then we could have gotten David Lynch's part one and part two. So so they cut out Absolutely. an hour. Yeah, an hour and 10 minutes of from, like you said, the extended cut down to the theatrical cut. I feel like that kind of makes the movie indecipherable. <laughs> they do this patchwork job of trying to fix that problem. By, in my opinion, this must have been added in post, but this whole idea of hearing characters' internal monologues. Oh, my goodness. Um, which caught me by surprise. I like I had seen the original Dune in chunks before, but I'd never sat and watched it all the way through until this week. I just didn't know that that was part of it. When I had seen those parts before, I thought it was like somebody reading somebody else's mind. And that does happen. But more often, you're just hearing what a character is thinking You'll get an inner monologue like in a noir detective movie where it's one character thinking throughout the whole, like in the, you know, theatrical cut of Blade Runner or whatever. Yeah, yeah. great example. You'll, you have one character thinking throughout the whole movie. It's not like every time you cut to a different character, you hear what's going on in their head. And this to me is like the death blow of Dune 1984. What do you guys think about this element of that film? Well, they they made fun of that to really hilarious effect in that South Park episode. Um, oh, which one? Remember, the one with the uh, spice. With like, he wants the spice. <laughs> oh, now that's going to be a must what? watch. I'm going to have to find that one. <laughs> I'm sure I've seen it, but I just didn't make the connection. Back then. <laughs> yeah, I remember it being really funny, but I don't think David Lynch. Like, if you look at his filmography, I don't think he really cared about following these rules that closely. <laughs> And I honestly, I kind of think it was like not totally misguided because there's so much inner monologue in the book that like there's moments in the book where the character will say something out loud. And then that's followed by a really long passage where it's talking about what they're actually thinking. And it's the complete opposite of what they said. And honestly, I feel like the new Dune movie might have even like benefited a little bit from that. Obviously, nobody was going to do the inner monologue thing again, but it did kind of let you in a little bit about what was going on in these characters' minds versus what we're seeing. That adds like a whole level of depth to it. One thing that I thought in the new movie could could have been a little stronger was this whole thing about the traitor. Baron Harkonnen talks about how there's like he has a traitor in House of Trades, but like none of the four group of characters around Paul like. Uh, Leto and Gurney and, and Buford Howitt and uh, Lady Jessica talk about the traitor that much in the new movie. But in that section of the book, that's like constantly on the back of everybody's mind is like, who is the traitor? Mm-hmm. There's a lot of like suspicion and distrust between those characters and a lot of kind of like fear and anxiety about it. I would have liked to have had more of that in the new movie because the uh, thing about there being a traitor just kind of lands with a little bit of a thud, just as kind of a plot device, mm. but there wasn't enough build up to it. This goes back to what I was saying about it's such a hard book to adapt because there's so many things. And no matter how careful you are, there's always going to be stuff that you're leaving out and that that fans are going to be upset that you left out. Like it's it's unavoidable. So I'm saying that about the new movie, but I think they did a really good job of figuring out what to leave in and what to take out can't do everything with this book. No, I totally agree. Going back to the inner monologue for one second, there is one line in the Denis Villeneuve Dune that reminded me of that when Duncan Idaho locks the door and like is fighting with those the other guys in that hallway. I forget which other character says it, but somebody says he's locked the door. (laughs) <laughs> it just it yes. should have been inner monologue like yeah we know that it's just why do you have to spell it out well that's a... that's that's a classic studio note i can tell you <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> everything has to be on the nose right. so i didn't i was just like oh studio note got it well, you have to spell it out for the audience exactly 
prior to watching the movie this last weekend, I'd only ever seen the hunter seeker part where Paul wakes up and the, the missiles coming through the room, the, the hunter seeker is going to stab him. And, he, and he's telling us the whole time, I have to be perfectly still or yeah. it will kill me. Oh no, someone's at the door. They'll be killed. And, and it's just, I, I thought that that was, I, I thought somebody was making fun of it. I thought the first time I watched it in standalone, I thought it was maybe some sort of Saturday Night Live sketch. Like, or a, like riff tracks. Yeah. It was like, it's visions based on movement. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but and there there were there were a couple every time they would go to Lady Jessica, is he the one? Uh, or oh my gosh, he might be the one. It just after a while it was it was actually kind of comforting because when they they, they and they always shot, <laughs> uh, moved a shot of the camera on, on the person and you, they kind of got a look in their eye and was like, well, here comes another inner thought. There it is. Yeah, it was an interesting choice, I have to say for sure. I am surprised and interested that John thought it was not totally misguided. I was surprised to hear you say that, but it, it uh, makes me look at it from a different light. Yeah, me too. Um, me too. Let's talk about what we do really like about the 1984 version of Dune. To me, you kind of mentioned this a little bit with the technology, John, but I thought the production design on this movie was incredible. Yes. The sets are all amazing. And the practical effects like the puppets and stuff that it, it felt very 80s to me in a great sure. way yeah with that stuff and i kind of missed that part of it in the new version i don't know what what do you guys think about that and do you have any other stuff from this original dune that you really like well yeah it does have that kind of like 80s it gives you that 80s nostalgic feeling which is great i i love i really like both movies i do think that the just design overall in david lynch's version is better to me but that that could also be because this is the that was the first version of dune that i had seen part of the point of the movies is just to give us like a visual reference for when we go read the books but dune its biggest strength is just the way it immerses you in this the feeling of this world the music the the sound design the set design the production design of all like the props and all that kind of stuff is just great I think with the new Dune movies, Denis Villeneuve has this very like kind of less is more kind of style with his design. Like you can kind of see it in some of his other movies, like the aliens in Arrival. You know, the ships are just these kind of like half domes yeah, turned sideways. And it's very like smooth. And then I also think about like in Blade Runner 2049, the guy who's making the androids, his whole like complex, very big with these very simple like smooth lines you can kind of see a lot of that in dune like everything's very like kind of streamlined you know the ships are very minimalist this ship is a sphere this ship is a cube and this ship is a cylinder that's a cool choice i kind of feel like the dune universe should be a little bit more ornate yeah uh, which is what i like about david lynch's dune is that um the sets and the costumes and the design feel a little bit more ornate because I think people in this universe would decorate a lot of these things more. Like in David Lynch's Dune, there's a scene where the the Atreides house is going into the uh, the Highliner. The entrance to the Highliner is very ornate. It looks like like a gold picture frame, like from a church or something. It just give us, gives it this kind of like religious significance, religious weight. And I think the Spacing Guild would be full of themselves enough to decorate their ship like that. That was, I think some stuff like that is kind of what I missed from the new movie. Yeah. Whereas everything in the new movie was like, like the the ornithopters and all the gear and equipment was very much just for utility. Like it didn't look like they put anything into like decorating it. But also you don't want to go too ornate and busy with the design, which is I think actually what they did in the sci-fi miniseries like they went a little bit too far with it so there's kind of like okay. a sweet spot but i think david lynch's dune hit it i'll best. agree with you there because i at personally i vastly prefer the ornate style almost kind of cluttered style to the more minimalist version but that difference i think makes both takes on this adaptation feel of of their own times uh what about you drew what did you what did you like about the 84 version? 
uh, three things really. Uh, one, the mat work. I mean, we haven't seen mats like that forever. The, the very first scene, I think it's the spacing guild when they're coming off the ship to address the emperor at the very beginning of the movie. The mm -hmm. mat that's set up and they've got it set so that there's a steam export on one side. So they, you know, they, they have enough to make it look three, you know, a little bit more uh, dimensional, but they set it up. So it's gorgeous. And I think the only way they could have done that back in 84 was with a mat. I, I just thought it was gorgeous. Uh, the second thing you mentioned earlier is the puppetry, the, the guild navigators, they were straight out of dark crystal in my mind. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and, and I love that they were exhaling and, you know, they, they had their own atmosphere in that, that one chamber that they were in. And that chamber, by the way, was super, super cool. And uh, the third thing we, we've talked about the sets, but I mean, just that one scene where Duncan Idaho is coming downstairs and he's going to go take on those, those other soldiers, they, they built this giant, it must've been 85 feet. I don't know how much money they spent on building just a quarter. That's only seen for three minutes. It's so detailed. And then I, I'm going to steal a fourth thing that, that I really liked the, the costuming. Mm -hmm. I loved the formal outfits of house of trades. Uh, they looked like, <laughs> frankly i don't know if there was nazi imagery on there on purpose uh, it seemed a little bit a little bit nazi-esque but then also the the harkonnen troops with their those like hazmat suits that they yeah. had yeah it just it was all of that i thought was really neat in the 98 in the 1984 version that was the action figure that i had growing up i had one dune action figure it was the guy in the black like hazmat suit so I'll always remember that, like decades before I ever saw the movie. I feel like those guys kind of make a, an appearance in the new Dune movie. I don't know if it was like an homage, but after like Leto bites into the tooth and releases the poison gas, there's like a scene where these guys in hazmat suits like go into the room carefully yeah. and they look very much like those guys from the, the Sardaukar from the original. Okay. I will say just the, the mirror to that, it was how gross the 84 version was. I yeah. mean, so that scene where Raban comes up and he's he's eating, I don't know, it was, was it the horse's ear or the cow's ear that he just plucked off and then just chewing it with his mouth open and just, I mean, and, and then of course the the Baron spitting on Jessica and I mean, uh, there was just- But just like, oh my he's gosh. got the, the blisters on his face that they're like Ugh. digging into. It's just like they went out of his way. Lynch went out of his way to make it as gross as possible. <laughs> Drew, I just want to comment really quickly on this little detail I noticed in the 84 version because you mentioned that- big chamber tank yeah. thing yeah. as they're rolling it out of the room one of the priestesses or whoever's like following them out is like mopping up the moisture yeah. or like sweeping up the moisture that yes. is left behind but they do a really poor job of it like they only do like <laughs> half and the rest is just like left behind like you left all that gross slime on my floor why they only respect the emperor so much. What can we say? <laughs> I think I, I, I'm going to nerd out a little bit. Okay. I, th I think that's like condensation from the spice gas. Oh, wow. Because okay. the, the navigators have to be in a cloud of spice gas all the time. But also nerding out even further, the Dune navigators don't appear in the first Dune novel. Like you never you never see them. Oh, wow. they're, just, that's cool. they're only talked about. So the whole thing with the guild navigator and the David Lynch's Dune was added. I don't know. Maybe they wanted to like set the feeling of the world like right from the get go by showing you like, hey, there's like aliens in this and big yeah. big costume. Yeah, like that because uh, the op the the Dune novel doesn't open in a very. I mean, it just kind of starts sort of like in media res. Mm -hmm. I think the uh, there's a little bit of setup of the world at the beginning. But then I think the first thing that happens after that is the scene where uh, the Reverend mother shows up to test Paul. Jessica goes into Paul's room to wake him up and says like, get dressed. It you got to stick your hand in a box, right? right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so we certainly don't mind any geeking out on this. No, show. absolutely not. We, <laughs> we welcome it. That. I did want to talk about the reception to this movie back when it first came out 40 years ago. And then kind of the, the legacy of, David Lynch is doing today. And if there has been an evolution in the reaction to this movie, like I was looking at some of the reviews that Wikipedia had corralled and like Roger Ebert called it, I think the worst movie of the year in 1984. He hated it. By and large, the reviews were negative. It didn't make a ton of money. I don't know, John, as a Dune fan, what do you think the legacy is of 
David Lynch's Dune, looking back on it now. Well, but by the way, I watched the Siskel and Ebert review of it on yeah. YouTube just to get ready for this. And yeah, they really hated it. <laughs> I mean, the, their their biggest criticism of it was it's ugly to look at. It's just like unpleasant to look at, which I don't think so. That's kind of typical Siskel and Ebert, but also that yeah. they couldn't they couldn't follow it at all and they weren't engaged in the story, which I think is the biggest problem with it is that people just didn't get it and the story was so abbreviated that they yeah. weren't engaged with it enough. And I think, like I said, uh, it's all stuff that if they had just planned this out a little bit better in the development phase and had a plan going in, they could have avoided a lot of this it's just the just the folly of trying to adapt dune in the first place that's inherent in every adaptation you're never going to get it right i um, guess so I, yeah i could just see audiences being completely baffled by this in, movie in 1984 for in sure. 84 i kept making a joke to my wife as we were watching like this is where the first group of people walked out of the theater <laughs> and this is where nice 10 more people left the theater <laughs> like it's just just ins- inscrutable, and I, I certainly understood the story a lot more in the in the current film. I can say that all of my yeah. friends who are also Dune nerds, uh, I'm I'm surrounded by them in my my personal life, and they love the 1984 version. And I'm kind of alone in preferring the new version, just because I had never seen the 1984 version. Most of my friends were young teens when they saw it for the first time back in 1984. So it stuck with them. And for folks who saw it way back when and maybe were younger and maybe enjoyed some of the grossness or enjoyed some of the maybe the cool things in it, because there is a lot of cool things in it. I I think that stuck with them more than than a lot of people think of. So I think that's maybe the legacy now. Fathom Events just had the 40th anniversary showing at theaters around the country, I think just last weekend. And I really wish, because I saw it on Max at home, and the transfer was very poor. All the mat lines are visible when they're moving things around. Uh, I couldn't help but think of Jaws 3D, Mike, when whenever the ships were flying on the screen, because, uh-huh. yeah, that's, that's universal. Sc- apparently, they're special effects. But I would have loved to have seen this and not have that kind of visible. I think it would have been a lot more fun. I looked it up on IMDb to check something. And I noticed it at a 6.3 on IMDb, which is not bad considering how panned it was when it came out. Yeah. I think there is some kind of a, a appreciation of it later we on. Can, we can call it I a don't know cult how much favorite. Of that is. Yeah, for sure. But look, I think the point, like I said, I think the point of a Dune movie is just to give you some kind of visual baseline right. to have in your head for when you go read the books. It, it's just, Adapting it 100% faithfully is never going to happen in a movie. It, every every movie adaptation of it is going to be like radically different. Some adaptations are going to get certain things right, while other adaptations will get those things wrong. Well, uh, speaking of adaptations, so there's a recent acclaimed documentary, Jodorowsky's Dune. Uh, apparently, there was an attempt in the gosh, early 70s, uh, maybe mid 70s to try to make the film. Are you familiar with the documentary, John? Yeah, it's been a while since I've seen it, but I remember the gist. Would that version maybe have been better received? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, like, <laughs> I think Jodorowsky wanted it to be like the ultimate movie to like eat mushrooms and go see. <laughs> uh, he just wanted it to be this like crazy acid trip of a movie. Uh, so sort of like a 2001 follow up. Yeah, exactly. And I think there is psychedelics is like a major theme in the books. Yeah, the spice. Sure. That's what spice is. You could definitely do a version like that and it'd be entertaining, but I I would be I would be fine with it existing as long as it wasn't the only version. (laughs) Right. Yeah. Because I think that having it be a little more grounded, which Denis Villeneuve's version is a little more grounded. And I think that's definitely a way to do it. I, I, I kind of wish I could take the strengths of all these different adaptations yeah. and like mush them together. Yeah, yeah. nice. <laughs> well, speaking of additional Dune adaptations, there are also two miniseries that came out in the early 21st century. You had Dune, the sci-fi channel miniseries that came out in 2000, and then it got a sequel. It was successful enough to have a sequel, Children of Dune. John, you mentioned the production design of these miniseries. So I'm assuming you've seen them 
what are your thoughts on those? Uh, I I watched some of it uh, and I stopped watching because it was kind of like ruining my uh, my Dune visual reference in my head. Okay. Oh no. Which I much preferred to be the. I'd, I'd rather have the David Lynch Dune be like my baseline for what the universe looks like. Okay. So I I kind of stopped watching because the the effects and the costumes were a bit much for me. And also part of the reason why they made those is because they wanted to be like a they wanted to like correct a lot of the mistakes of the David Lynch version. But they like if that's what they were trying to do, they they didn't change enough. Mm. It, it still has the inner monologue thing. Oh yeah, in, in certain scenes, yeah. And I was like, well. I thought that was one of the things that people didn't like about the David Lynch <laughs> version, but you're still doing it. If if they meant it to be like the more more faithful adaptation of the book, I feel like they didn't go far enough in terms of like um, staying true to the book because probably the best format for a Dune adaptation would be like a eight episode series where you can really get into the details and and build the world and see every bit of it. Yeah, right. Well, it looks like the uh, the original miniseries, the, the Dune miniseries, it looks like it's available in its entirety on YouTube. So I'm going to have to check that out just because having watched the 84 version just now, I'm very curious to see what other visions there would be since uh, I'm a fan of the recent movies. So I'm craving a little bit more. And that's a great segue to bring us to the most recent Dune adaptation in 2021, a mere three years ago. We got Dune part one and the sequel part two is coming up in just a couple weeks as of this recording. What did we think of this one? What was your first response when you saw this in the theater, John, in 2021? To be perfectly honest, I was really busy at the time and I didn't get to see it in the theater. I have a really nice size TV. I watched it on HBO Max with headphones and good sound. I I did the same thing, so don't feel too bad. All right. (laughs) And I thought it was like, fine. I feel like I was kind of addicted to the David Lynch Dune as being kind of like my baseline for how the universe was supposed to look, you know? Yeah. Yeah. But I, I, I will say that I've watched it a few times since then, and I do appreciate it more with every like repeat viewing. And um, also like going back and just like refreshing myself about the book like I read over the cliff notes of the first book again, just to like refresh my memory, but they followed it way more closely. But then, like I said, design wise, um, they made a lot of interesting choices that I think were good. I think it's an extremely well-made movie, really well done on every level. But I, I guess I just prefer design wise, the feel of the David Lynch version. Uh, this one's a lot more, a lot more grounded I would have liked it to feel a little more surreal overall because the character is just in and out of this kind of like dream state. And uh, I would have liked to feel that a little bit more. It's a really remarkable achievement. I'm excited to see the next one. Uh, So Drew, it seems like both you and I were first introduced to the world of Dune through this newer film. What was it that struck you about this when you saw it? Everything. I love this movie. I think it was maybe like the third movie I'd seen in a theater since the pandemic. And so it was one of my, it, it was definitely on the largest screen that I had, had, had seen. Uh, and just the sound, I mean, the sound of the ships flying through the air, the ornithopter, the ship at the beginning before it lands, uh, and they come out to greet the House of Atreides uh, when the Spacer Guild comes, uh, or the Guild Navigators, I don't know what to call them. Spacer Guild might be from something else. I love the design. I'm a huge fan of all of the actors. As we we talked recently uh, when we covered Silo a couple of weeks ago, Mike, uh, Rebecca Ferguson is on my list and seeing her was <laughs> a, a wonderful, wonderful thing. Uh, Oscar Isaac is another favorite of mine and I think he did a, an amazing job playing uh, the Duke. And I, I'm, I'm not a giant Timothy Chalamet fan, but I love him in this role. I just really feel like he captured the the I don't want to say the innocence, but Paul is, you know, he's ready to get on with his legacy. He's ready to to get out in the world. And, and you can tell he's hungry to make his mark. And I think he did a fabulous job of, you know, showing a character who's excited to be part of the world, but also a little scared of maybe the things he can do or might be able to do. I don't know if you, you noticed, but I really dug this movie. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of one of the other things I wanted to talk about was the cast. 
the cast of both films, uh, uh, they're both stacked with so many ringers. Yeah. Um, Dean Stockwell. I was from, stunned. From yes. Quantum Leap. Brad Dourif, one of my favorite character actors. And then, you know, the the whole cast of the Lynch one is great. And the new one, you've got, oh boy, everyone in it is super famous. I don't know. Which which cast do you prefer? Uh, well, I like Timothy Chalamet because Paul is supposed to be younger. In the book, I think he's like 16 or 17. Okay. And, okay. And Fade Rautha, who uh, appears in Dune 2, is also, I think, 17 years old. So obviously, Timothy Chalamet looks younger, and they also wrote him to feel a little bit younger so that I think for so that like young men in today's world could like connect with him or resonate a little bit with them, feel a little bit more familiar. I really like Kyle McLaughlin's performance. I think he did a really good job, but I think Timothy Chalamet did even better. When I watched it again recently, the scene where he has his hand in the box and just the the his reaction to the pain. Yes. That was that was just amazing acting because I can tell you like for an actor, it's really hard to fake severe pain. That's like a really hard thing to do. And just like the look on his face, his expressions and the way he was reacting to that was just so spot on. Like you really felt the the pain just from watching him. And that was just really amazing acting. Well, and Kyle McLaughlin's acting in that scene also, having literally just watched this within the last two days, I, I thought that was really amazing. Of course, it helped that you had the Sam Raimi-esque effects of the hand like dissolving and then turning into like bloody messes inside the box, which was also a really good way of showing it. <laughs> The the Reverend Mother character, like in the new Denis Villeneuve version, she's more like kind of like a strict school marm mm -hmm. sort of. Yes. Like she's just very strict and very rigid and terse with him. In the David Lynch version of Dune, that character is a lot more like kind of condescending to him and feels like she's kind of toying with him a little bit. I don't know which one's right, really, but, you know, the, the Bene Gesserit Reverend Mother would obviously be trying to assert her like su superiority over yeah. him. So there's like different ways you could do it. Like in the, in the new version, she's just more, she's just like very strict and very terse. Whereas like in David Lynch's version, she's kind of like condescending and seems to be kind of like toying around with him to make him feel less than. Yeah. And, and uh, she was, she was legitimately sorry. She couldn't stab him with a gom jabar. I mean, she was upset that he actually passed the test. <laughs> There's different ways to do it. I I kind of like I thought the 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 version in the David Lynch movie was maybe more like kind of entertaining. Yes. All all his caricatures in his version are a lot more a little bit more over the top and a little more much more animated. Hence all the spitting. <laughs> <laughs> exactly all that stuff. Yeah. <laughs> I couldn't help but notice the Star Wars connections in the cast. This is not who's the boss, but I had to point this out. In the original, you have Max von Sydow, yes. who is in The Force Awakens as Lor Santeca. You've got, of course, Oscar Isaac in the new one and Stellan Skarsgård, who is in Andor. And then from Star Trek in the original, you have Patrick Stewart playing the Josh Brolin role. Which I absolutely loved. I mean, to me, Josh Brolin, I, I still see him and I think No Country for Old Men or I, I think some of his other rugged roles that he's played, uh, Cable even in Deadpool, yeah. where he's kicking ass. Just the idea that Patrick Stewart was somehow that much of a badass, which I just love. Uh, hey, but, Captain Picard is a badass, man. Sure, sure. Yeah, sure. he's total badass. <laughs> right. And well, the, speaking of, he gets to say like the most awesome lines in he the does. English version. He gets to he say does. like, this is a Harkonnen animal. You know? <laughs> <laughs> like with total sincerity and conviction. It's really great. Yeah, really and, proving himself to say a bunch of weird alien uh, words and names for the future. I love that he was carrying the pug when the Harkonnen is attacked. I just, I re, oh wait, is he wearing that on a, like a baby sling? And I had to rewind and like, he is, he's carrying the Duke's dog, which is great. Oh, that was, that was awesome. But speaking of badasses, I have loved Richard Jordan uh, since Secret of My Success. That's where I was introduced to Richard yes. Jordan. Then later on, seeing him in Logan's Run, uh, I was thrilled to see him here. He was completely wasted as Duncan Idaho, unfortunately. But in yep. the new movies, Jason Momoa just did a spectacular job with that role. Spoiler alert for like the entire Dune series, but Duncan Idaho is like the most important character in 
the entire series. Nice. He's probably the only character who appears in every single book in some iteration um, because they just keep cloning him. Somehow, Uh, Duncan Idaho returned. So (laughs) when I saw that they had cast Jason Momoa, I was like, okay, cool. But, you know, if if you're going to make the rest of the books, like he's there's going to be a lot of him just sitting around talking to giant worm people. (laughs) <laughs> i'm there for it i'm i'm on board that's gonna work for me i'm totally down but i i'm with you like it's so sad that they didn't use richard jordan enough because he that was just really great casting other great casting too i didn't realize sean young was in this movie so when she popped up i i didn't google to see if she this was an early film of hers it must have been but uh it was fabulous to see a little more sean young again uh Actually, so she would have done Blade Runner, obviously, before this. So this was a little bit, obviously, later in her career, obviously. But not only that, but I wanted to know who the little girl was at the end. And it was actress Alicia Witt. Alicia Witt, yeah. Who is also in Twin Peaks, I believe. John, uh, correct me if I'm mistaken. Yeah, no. And uh, Urban Legends, right? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, So was she Aaliyah, his sister? Yes. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. That was my favorite performance in... The David Lynch version that <laughs> knocked my socks it's off. It's creepy. Yeah. <laughs> Not to mention the 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 scene where she was born prematurely and they show this just hideously gross baby shot thing. Which I, I just seeing that on my large screen television really, really did not do me any favors. <laughs> they made Dune 1984. The only movies that David Lynch had done that people really knew about were Eraserhead and Elephant Man. Like they had to have known that the guy who had made those movies would put like gross stuff in the movie. I think it's funny how people are so shocked by how gross it is. It's like, but did you see the movies by the guy that <laughs> you hired to do this? You know? That's awesome. That's awesome. I'm very curious to see what they do with Alia in the Dune part two. Uh, Cause I didn't see her in the trailers and I didn't see anyone credited on IMDb as playing her. Mm. Um, but she's like a, a central figure in the the next like three novels. Where where Dune Part One ended in the book, they jump ahead two years. Mm-hmm. At some somewhere around that point in the novel, they jump ahead two years. Alia has been born and she's now like a toddler, but she talks like an adult because she's born with all the memories of their ancestors. Well, yeah. Alicia Witt in the David Lynch Dune was way older than that character is in the book. Okay. She's actually like a, like a little toddler walking around talking like an adult. So I'm very curious to see how they're going to handle that. I kind of have a feeling that they might just make her not born yet and get rid of the two year gap mm. and just have it be more of a direct continuation. Like she's, she's just hasn't had the baby yet. Yeah. They that makes get rid sense. Of the two years. She's just like nine months pregnant by the end or something like that. You must have something else you're hoping to see in Dune part two. That's the main thing. Other than that, I'm just really looking forward to just the visuals of it. I'm yeah. really looking forward to seeing like an updated version of all these like grand spectacles or promise. Like David Lynch's Dune is limited by the effects capabilities of the time, but I'm really excited to see like photorealistically a giant worm like smashing a big a Legion of Sardaukar. Yeah. It's be awesome. Yeah. Those battle scenes are going to Precise. be spectacular. Yeah. I mean, yeah. the Fremen attacking at the end. I mean, that's just going to be I, I imagine it's going to be amazing looking. I think that's one of the other failings of the David Lynch version in in cutting it down. The back half of that movie just feels really, really rushed. So I think that's the advantage of splitting it into two movies. Is sure. that you can really take your time with it. So that's what I'm looking forward to. Have, not having read the novel, seeing that part of the movie in a more better paced version. Yeah, they they split it at just the right point too because there's a uh, at the point where the split is between the two movies there's a, like a lot of stuff that happens where Paul is just kind of like learning about the Fremen traditions and the siege and to me it's the part of the book that drags the most so kind of like they do with the Star Wars movies where like like the gap that you put between two movies in a series is a storytelling device in itself. And it's, then you can go and write a bunch of comics and novels to fill in. The- <laughs> sure, sure. <laughs> right. But there's just so much that the audience will just intuit by putting a yeah. break there. They solved a lot of problems by putting the break where they did. I have a feeling it's going to open with, I don't know if you saw in the trailer, there's a scene of uh, Fade mm-hmm. Rautha killing a guy in an arena. Yeah. Which is in the book. 
but that scene happens around this point in the book and we introduce a lot of new characters. So I wouldn't be surprised if they started with that. And their character is played by Austin Butler. Hopefully he's lost the Elvis voice. So we'll be in good shape. <laughs> I heard he went, he had to go through some kind of uh, training to eliminate the Elvis accent. <laughs> sure. He, he did such a good job of it in Elvis. I can imagine he had to figure out how to desaturate that somehow. Well, I, I just think it's going to be spectacular. I mean, just the fact that they're not going to have to worry about shooting the the pew pew ray guns, the Chris knife battles and whatever the, the larger, there's got to be larger blades that they use that maybe you're aware of, John. But I, I just think those battle scenes are going to be epic. Well, they have like explosives and like or like rocket launchers and atomics and stuff like that, but they just don't have the, the voice activated weirding <laughs> module. Oh, one other thing I wanted to mention that occurred to me as I was watching 1984 Dune for the first time is the connection to that Fat Boy Slim song with the Christopher Walken music video. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? I, yep. I do. Yeah. Oh, sure. Where he's flying I, I around. Mean, no, it's there's a line in that song that's like, if you walk without with if you walk without rhythm, walk without rhythm, you won't, you won't attract, attract the worm. The worm. And it's a line from Dune. Oh I had no gosh. idea. <laughs> I I now that you say that, of course I can't not hear it. Of course. <laughs> No, he just needs to make another song where he just comes out and says, fear is the mind killer. <laughs> <laughs> well, this has been an awesome conversation about a franchise that I hadn't really explored before, which was part of the mission statement going into this podcast. So uh, very, very happy to talk about this with both you, Drew, and our guest today, John William Ross, or John Ross, as I have called him for 25 years. John, thank you so much for coming on the show and chatting with us about Dune. Thank you. I had a great time. Well, that was us talking to my friend John William Ross all about Dune. And you can go and watch John's movie, Grim Cuddy. It's available to stream on Hulu. D has he talked about Dune in the past? Did, did you know that he was a Dune guy? I just remembered like 15 years ago, he told me he was trying to read every Dune novel. And like you said, during our chat, I don't think he ever got through all of them because I think there's a ton. Yeah. But he did certainly make it a good way through them. Talking to folks like him is exactly what I'm hoping to do with this podcast. It's I truly am looking forward to going back and watching scenes from Dune 1984 with kind of his appreciation because it's going to help me see it a little differently. And it's really funny to me, actually, I was thinking while he was talking that you and I kind of chatted a little bit going into the interview and I don't think either of us liked that voiceover inner monologue. I was surprised that John had a different take on it. So yeah. uh, it made me look at it from a different angle. Yeah, yeah, that's that's exactly what we want to do. Here. <laughs> I can't wait to see what else is going to happen when we do this show. So as always, if you'd like to reach out and contact us here at the Pop Culture Explorers Club, you can find us on Instagram under that handle, Pop Culture Explorers Club, or you can email us. And the email address is email at popcultureexplorersclub.com. Because we like to do things very cleverly here, so that works <laughs> pretty well for us. Mostly we couldn't think of anything else. There's that. There is that. <laughs> so for this week, my name is Mike Celestino. And I'm Drew Gergich. And until next time, wait for my brother.